So at number 10 in this episode, Catholics worship Mary. Well, the church's devotion to the Virgin Mary, it dates back to the very first set of believers. And the Catechism, which is the summary of the principles of the religion, states that although it is very special, Marian devotion differs essentially from the adoration which is given to the Incarnate Word and equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the Incarnate Word in that context refers to Jesus. It also says that prayer to the Blessed Mother of God always remained centered on the person of Christ manifested in his mysteries. All that we believe about Mary is based on our faith in Christ. Next up at number 9, the Pope is always right. Uh uh, not at all. Papal infallibility is what it's called, and that simply means that a belief held since the early church by Christians can be formally pronounced and defined by a pope because of the office that the pope holds. So the pope can't simply just make up anything. Whatever doctrine is pronounced must be conformable with sacred scripture and apostolic traditions. This is what the Catholic Church says. Now, papal infallibility does not apply to everything that the Pope says, and it only applies to pronouncing doctrine that has already been held and passed down by the Church through scripture and tradition. Catholics are anti-gay. That comes in at number eight. The Church does not hate any group of people. As a matter of fact, Jesus has commanded his followers to love everyone, even love their enemies. And that kind of love really has no room anywhere for any type of hatred towards anyone. And the Catholic Catechism, it states that gay and lesbian people must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. The Catholic Church does not endorse an approach that requires all persons with same-sex attraction to become straight or heterosexual. The Catholic Church teaches that God calls all people, including those of same-sex attractions, to live a life of virtue and chastity. And for people with same-sex attractions, well, living chastely includes not engaging in homosexual acts. From there, we look at number seven. Catholics can't read the Bible, or they're not allowed to. Well, Catholics are actually encouraged to read and pray with the Bible, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, and I quote, The Church forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. The next slide we're going to look at is only Catholics can go to heaven. Yes, Catholics are accused of believing that only people who follow their religion will go to heaven. Although Catholics do believe that their religion is the one true religion, they do recognize that God can use any means that he wants to bring somebody to the knowledge of himself, including means through other religions. Also, Catholics do not believe that you can 100% say that somebody is going to heaven or somebody is going to hell. That simply would be playing God. Only God can make that sort of judgment. And who can assume to fully understand and know the mind of God and what God is going to decide? Continuing now with number five, Catholics are anti-women. Well, Catholics do believe that birth control and abortions are morally wrong. But when other denominations began to change their stance on these topics, the Catholic Church held its ground and they continue to do so. The Catholic Church also doesn't allow women to be priests, which has upset quite a bit of people. However, their rate of women in non-priest leadership positions is much higher than the average. And it is said that the Catholic Church may not necessarily do things the way that feminists do them or the way that feminists want things to be done, but they do hold women in a very high regard and even refer to them as the crown of creation. Moving on to line number four, the church added to the Bible. Now, this is a big one. The Catholic version of the Old Testament differs from the Protestant version. The Catholic edition contains seven more books than the Protestant Bibles. And these so-called extra books are the reason that many people consider the church to have added to the Bible. But Catholics believe that these books were considered the official canon or list of books by all Christians until the Protestant Reformation, during which the man named Martin Luther, who's leader of the revolution, removed those books. 
Now, the Catholic Church uses the Greek collection of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint because they believe that the apostles of Jesus used it exclusively in their preaching of the gospel. And then Martin Luther, they believe, however, decided to use the Jewish Masoretic Canon of the Old Testament instead. And the seven extra books in the Catholic Bible are Tobit, Judith, 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, Wisdom, Sirach, and this book is also known as Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes though, and they also have the book Baruch. Number three, Catholics aren't Christians. Catholics believe that they are the first Christians, and when reading over early Christian writings, you'll see references to certain doctrines that Catholics still hold to this day, like doctrines about the bishops and virgins living in community, now known as nuns, also priests and confessions, baptism of infants. And it's said that a lot of these doctrines actually are in the books that the Protestant Bible doesn't have. Number two, this one was a very surprising one to me. Priests cannot get married. Within the Universal Church, there are sections also called churches, but not in the sense that they are separate entities. However, the most common one is the Roman or Latin Catholic Church. And then there's the Eastern Catholic Church. And this, by the way, is not to be confused with the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is a completely different religion. But either way, both of these churches, they fall under the jurisdiction of the Pope and all believe pretty much the exact same doctrines. Now, there is some differences between how they look at worship and worship styles, as well as some different rules, but generally they're the same. In the Eastern Church, priests are allowed to be married, but a married priest can't become a bishop. Also, occasionally in the Roman Catholic Church, pastors who converted from other religions are allowed to become priests even though they are married. So married priests can actually be found all around the world in the Roman Catholic Church. And number one, the most sensitive lie in this list, all priests are predators. Now we've heard cases of priests preying on young children, but there just isn't the number support to show that all priests do this. At worst, the numbers are about 4% of priests can be credibly linked to abuse. And by the way, this is still way too high. This should never happen. But the priesthood itself isn't just filled with predators and perverts. Again, this is in no way defending any priest that would do such a horrible thing. But rather, this is really just to clear up the misconception that all priests do this. Because the reality is most priests don't even fall in this category. All right, coming up at number 10, why do some popes wear red shoes? Interesting question. So throughout history, many popes have worn red shoes as it is said to memorialize the blood of Christian martyrs. But red shoes were actually a Roman status symbol well before the birth of Jesus, when only the aristocrats could afford the expensive dye to produce the vivid red color. After the advent of Christianity, cardinals and the Pope adopted red vestments and the red papal shoes have been carried over from that time. Now, of course, the red shoes are not a mandatory part of the wardrobe and some popes have simply chosen to wear black or brown leather loafers. Up next, what is the Pope's salary? Money, money, money. Well, contrary to many beliefs, popes aren't raking big bucks into their personal bank accounts. While you can't exactly pull up the Pope's salary online, the Vatican has confirmed that the Pope is not a paid salary. However, the Vatican does have a budget raised largely through its museums and banks that covers all the day-to-day -day financial needs of the Pope, such as food, travel, clothing, and other living expenses, as well as the costs of Vatican upkeep and staff. All right, now, can the Pope have pets? It seems unfortunate, but true that the Pope and any other residents of the Vatican are not allowed to have pets. Now, this prohibition on on papal pets hasn't always been in place. Some popes have reportedly kept a dog or a cat and even a canary, but more contemporary popes have respected the restrictions on pets in the Vatican. In fact, when Benedict XVI, a well-known animal lover, became pope, his beloved cat Chico was left in the care of the housekeeper of his own private residence. All right, up at number seven, is the pope allowed to grow a beard? Well, beards have become an increasingly mainstream look for men from all walks of life, with 
the exception of the popes. Now, listen, it's not specifically forbidden for the pope to grow a beard. In fact, Pope Innocent XII, who passed away in 1700, was actually the last pope to rock a beard. Since then, all subsequent popes have just opted for a clean shaven face. Now, this is likely because Roman canon tradition encourages clean shaven clergy so that facial hair doesn't disrespect the blood of Christ by grazing the communion wine. Ugh, that would be kind of gross, right? <laughs> All right, this next one is personal because I love vacations. And can the Pope take personal vacations? While being a spiritual leader to the world's more than 1 billion Catholics would be a very demanding vocation for anyone. So how does the Pope kick back and relax when the job gets to be a little too much. Well, don't expect to see the Pope downing a margarita on the beach in Mexico anytime soon, but they do definitely take some time off for some quiet rest and relaxation. The Pope actually has access to a vacation house known as Castel Gandolfo, a swanky summer residence in the hills about 25 kilometers from the Vatican, and it even has a pool. Popes have used Castel Gandolfo to escape Rome's summer heat for almost 400 years and have generally used their vacation time as you would expect, reading, praying, and composing religious texts. All right, up at number five in the halfway point in today's video, what happens when a pope passes away? Well, in modern times, a doctor first certifies that the pontiff is deceased and a Latin pronouncement is made. The Camerlengo, a cardinal who serves as the administrative head of the Vatican, is then summoned to confirm the pope's passing through a series of rituals. Once the Camerlengo is sure that the pope has indeed passed and is not just in a deep sleep, he destroys the ring of the fisherman worn by the pope and historically used to seal papal correspondence, as well as any other papal seal. Then the Pope's quarters are sealed off and public and diplomatic announcements of the passing, including the ringing of the bells at St. Peter's are made and funeral arrangements can begin along with the selection of the next Pope. Okay, this is a big one. This one was interesting. Can the Pope watch movies and TV? What do you think? Yes, the Pope can watch TV and or movies. In fact, the Vatican has its own film library with over 8,000 titles, as well as a tiny movie theater to show them in, which was converted from its former use as a chapel. However, don't picture the Pope curling up with some popcorn, binge watching Breaking Bad. Popple media viewing, at least the ones that are publicly reported, tend to be pretty tame. Of course, it would be perfectly acceptable for them to keep up with their favorite sports games or the evening news on TV during their personal time as well. Now you might be wondering what does the Pope eat and drink? Are there things they can and can't eat or drink? Well the Pope is generally not limited by rules regarding food and drink. Some Popes have even brought in their own personal cooking staff to work in the kitchen whipping up delicious dishes of pasta, pizza, strudel and tiramisu. In contrast though some popes prefer to take their meals in the Vatican Hotel dining room with other residents and generally favor very plain and simple meals. Now, in terms of drinks, there are no prohibitions on the pope's consumption of alcohol, and most popes have occasionally treated themselves to the occasional highball, a beer, or a little bit of wine. Now, up at number two, the question, does the pope ever dress casually? Now, it can be hard to imagine the Pope wearing anything but his trademark white robes, but does he ever get to dress down? The answer is yes, the Pope sometimes wears casual clothes, but to avoid damaging his image, the more ordinary outfits are usually kept out of the public eye. For example, if the Pope puts on sweatpants or a pair of jeans, he typically does so behind closed doors during his own personal time. And up at number one, famous question, does the the Pope ever sneak out of the Vatican. Let's face it, it's lonely at the top and too often the strict security restrictions that limit their mobility and privacy have led many popes to sneak out of the Vatican, traveling incognito to avoid unwanted attention. Some of the more popular sneak outs include off the record trips to ski and hike in the Italian Alps, unannounced visits to local art exhibits, late night walks through Rome, trips to the optician to get a new pair of glasses, and even lunchtime hunts for the best 
slice of pizza in the city. Although the primary function of the Knights Templar was for military purposes, a large portion of the order were actually not even knights at all. At any one time, there were only a couple hundred true knights within the Knights Templar, with the rest of them being non-combatant soldiers, as well as priests, regular laborers, and even women. Also, when it comes to the Temple of Solomon, this was a biblical temple that is thought to have once stood on Temple Mount in the holy city of Jerusalem, which is today the location of the famous Dome of the Rock, as well as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. After they were founded, the Templars, they based themselves at Temple Mount, repurposing the Al-Aqsa Mosque that stood there as their headquarters. Now, that site, which was built on the long gone Temple of Solomon, gave the order their name the fellow soldiers of Christ of the Temple of Solomon, or known in short as the Knights Templar. Did you know that the Knights Templar had a very strict set of rules when it came to war and combat? One of the most important rules that they had was that a knight could never, ever, ever surrender while the Red Cross was raised over the battlefield. So what they had to do when they joined the order, all Templars, they agreed to lay down their lives for the order in case anything happens, meaning that they could not stop fighting or try to flee until the flags were no longer raised. So when we mix their training with their dedication and their willingness to fight literally until their last breath, well, that made the Knights Templar one of the most fearsome enemies that anybody can face in the battlefield. Now, I did mention that women were also part of the Templars, but although they couldn't become knights specifically, since women at that time were not expected to fight in war, many Templar chapters or different locations that the Templars would meet in, they did include some women who would aid them in spiritual endeavors. Most of these women were nuns who helped the priests with their prayers, as well as offering any medical or psychological assistance to the soldiers returning from the battlefield, and in general, just be moral support for them. Women as well as men could also become associate members by making regular donations to the Knights Templar, despite never actually taking the oath to become a knight. For fact number six, let's talk about the Cross of the Knights Templar. Now, this cross right here was actually designed by the Pope. Only 10 years after the Knights Templar came into existence, they were officially designated as an order of the Catholic Church at the Council of Troyes in 1129. Initially, members who joined the order were granted the use of white cloaks to be worn over their armor to distinguish themselves. Eventually, Pope Eugene III allowed the use of a simple red cross to symbolize the martyrdom of the members who would lay down their life for defending the faith. So there is actually no single design of the cross. Instead, there's many different variations of the design that would be worn by different chapters of the Knights Templar. Continuing with fact number five, the Knights Templar, they started as an order that took the vow of poverty. But despite this, the order itself, they actually ended up acquiring a lot of wealth and assets from its members, but also from the spoils that they gained from war. The Knights Templar also had control over about 800 castles at their peak, and these castles actually served as regional financial institutions. As the Knights Templar's influence continued to spread throughout Egypt, this practice became widespread across the entire continent and eventually into different parts of the world. And the order also eventually established a system that functioned much like a modern day checking account at a bank. But although they had a pretty good run at domination, the Knights Templar were ultimately declared as heretics and they were condemned. In the late 12th century, Islamic forces eventually took back Jerusalem and expelled any Christian influence there. This forced the Knights Templar to return to Europe and reestablish themselves in France. Now, because of their prominence in France, the Knights Templar, they ended up giving a large sum of money to the French king, Philip IV, who ended up spending the money and wasting it on useless combat. Eventually, the order refused to lend the king any more of their money because of this. So in response, it said that 
Philip, he devised a plot to destroy the Knights Templar, and in the year 1307, he declared them to be heretical and guilty of sorcery, and he forced Pope Clement V to join in on this decision. There's some other charges that were thrown against them too. Now, the Catholic Church ultimately withdrew its recognition of the Order and the Knights Templar. They ended existence officially. However, many of the members ended up fleeing to various parts of Europe, and the allocation of the Knights Templar's great wealth, people are still wondering exactly what happened. So that's a topic that's debated up until this day. Now, for fact number three, not discovered until 2001, there is a Shino parchment that was an official ruling by Pope Clement V, dated back to August 1308 CE. And this exonerated the Knights Templar of all the charges laid against them by King Philip. And from this parchment, we learned how the Pope was pressured into dismantling the order by the King of France and has since led the Roman Catholic Church to officially acquit all of the Templars that were tried and executed on charges of heresy. But you know, it's a little too late. A lot of them lost their lives during that time. Now, there is one theory that is very popularized in pop culture, specifically in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, and that is that the Knights Templar were actually not killed because of money-related issues by King Philip, but instead they were actually killed for what they knew about the secret bloodline of Jesus Christ. And that secret that they knew was that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and they had a child. The secret society that was said to have contained this knowledge was called the Priory of Sion, which had deep connections to the Knights Templar. There's a whole lot of speculation about this theory. Some say myth, some say, hey, Dan Brown was onto something and that this is actual fact. But either way, moving on to our last fact of this episode, a possible origin of the unlucky superstitious day of Friday the 13th has to do with the downfall of the Knights Templar. On Friday the 13th of October 1307, that's when King Philip IV ordered the arrest of all Templars in France and the charges of idol worship, disrespecting the cross, denial of Jesus and his divinity, among other things, were laid on them. And due to this happening on a Friday the 13th, that's when the superstition began. So if anyone does bring up the Friday the 13th superstition, chances are nothing bad's gonna happen to you, but at least you know where it started from. So let's jump right in. Let's start with number 10, the name meanings. Now I kind of mentioned a little bit about this in part one about Protestantism, but the term Catholic, what does that even mean? Well, it's from Greek origin and that word Catholicos, that means universal. <laughs> Protestant simply means, well, to protest, you know, protest is in the name of the class of denomination. Very easy, very simple. Whoa. Moving on now to number nine, we have the nature of the church. So Catholics and Protestants, they have a different view on the nature of the church. So the term Catholic, like I mentioned, really refers to being a universal church and the Catholic church sees itself as the only true church worldwide under the leadership of the Pope. Now, in contrast, the Protestant churches, which came out of the Protestant Reformation, they're also sometimes synonymous with the term evangelical, and that means according to the gospel. And they do not make up one united church, though, like the Catholic Church does. There are several tens of thousands of different Protestant denominations all around the world. So officially, all of these many different churches are considered equal. Celibacy is another difference. Now, not just in Catholicism and Protestantism, but in different religions, the concept of celibacy, which is the vow of abstaining from marriage as well as sexual relationships, pretty much all of the major world religions have some form of concept of celibacy that's taught, which is pretty much the vow from abstaining from marriage or other sexual relations. Now in the Catholic Church, celibacy is obligatory for all priests and it's seen as a symbol of the undivided succession of Christ. For Protestant churches, they completely disregard the whole obligation for priests to be celibate. 
Now, Martin Luther, the German monk who led the Protestant Reformation, demanded its abolition as early as 1520. And he made himself pretty much an example of this because he was a former monk and he married a former nun named Katharina von Bora. And initially unsure of whether he should marry, Martin Luther finally determined that yes, his marriage would please his father, rile the Pope, cause the angels to laugh, as well as the devils to weep. And that is not my own words, that's actually a quote. But then again, in Protestantism, celibacy is a choice of a couple or even a pastor or a church leader wants to be celibate for whatever reason, that's their choice. Let's take a look at the difference now in the teachings of life after death. So for Catholics, there is eternal salvation that you achieve in heaven. There's also eternal damnation in hell. But then there's another concept. There's like a third kind of temporary state between heaven and hell, and that's known as purgatory. But for Protestants, there's no such thing as purgatory. Those who believe in Jesus as the savior go to heaven, but those who don't and follow the works of the devil end up in hell. Also, one of the big differences is the Catholic Bible. Now, the Catholic Bible contains 73 books recognized by the Catholic Church in its canon, and the following books, Tobit, Judith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Wisdom, Sirach, and Barak, those are considered to be deuteronomical books of the Bible. Now, Catholic Bibles are said to have remained unchanged following the Protestant Reformation, and so they retained seven books that were rejected mainly by Martin Luther. Now, its canon of its Old Testament text is larger than the translations used by Protestants. Now, the Protestant canon, which does not accept all the books that are included in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament of the Bible, their canon contains 66 total books, unlike the 73 for the Catholic Bible. All right, so now moving on to Ooh. difference number five in this episode, let's talk about the Holy Days. For the Catholic religion, there's Christmas, there's Lent, there's Easter, Pentecost, as well as Saints' Feast Days. Protestantism, not as many holidays. You'll find, though, Christmas and Easter being celebrated by Protestants, though. There's also differences in the clergy. So like I mentioned in part one, for the Catholic Church, there is the Pope. But following the Pope, there are cardinals, archbishops, bishops and priests, monks and deacons. Also, you'll find women becoming nuns as well. Now for Protestant churches, each church is completely independent and it's usually headed by a pastor and elders as well as deacons. There's no office of priests or nuns or archbishops or bishops in Protestantism. Although some Protestant ministers may have the title bishop, it's not necessarily considered an official position in Protestantism. <laughs> All right, now at number three, let's take a look at the use of statues and pictures. Catholics are completely accepting of the depiction of Jesus Christ, Mary, as well as other saints in the form of statues and different pictures, paintings, graphic designs, pencil sketches, you name it. Also, their images can be displayed on walls at home. You can wear them on jewelry, tattoos on your body, as well as displayed as murals inside churches. Now for Protestants, they generally limit the depictions being used and displayed in churches. And depending on the branch of Protestantism, they may forbid all depictions of Jesus completely. And to keep things really simple, usually a symbol of a cross is used in Protestantism. But for the most part, images aren't so heavily used like the Catholic Church. Similar to number three, we have number two, relics. For Protestant churches, there was no real value in relics or images. And this is because Protestants believe that individuals went to heaven through faith as well as a direct relationship with God alone. So therefore using relics and different images as well as conducting pilgrimages and worship of saints, as well as living a celibate life, they were seen simply as distractions to the true faith. But on the flip side though, when it comes to the Catholic Church, relics were particularly very valuable to the Catholic Church, as well as monasteries and cathedrals would allow people to come and pray to them. So people often went on long journeys known as pilgrimages in order to pray to these relics. 
Now finally, the difference at number one is the prominent locations. Now, according to the CIA fact book, as well as the Pew Research Center, the five countries that have the largest number of Catholics are Brazil, Mexico, the Philippines, the United States, and Italy. And the country where the membership of the church is the largest percentage of the total population, well, it's Vatican City, you know, that's 100%. Everybody's Catholic there. And that's followed by East Timor, where 97% of the population identifies Catholic. Now, over in the European countries, which were greatly affected by the Protestant Reformation, Protestantism still remains the most practiced religion. And these include the Nordic countries, as well as the United Kingdom. Since the early 1900s, Protestantism has also spread greatly across Africa, Asia, Oceania, as well as South America. But the areas where Protestantism has as its largest dominance are in North America and also in Europe, like I mentioned. Everywhere else, for the most part, the percentage of the population identify more so as Catholic than they do Protestant Christians.